What's good, y'all? Boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 greatest SummerSlam builds in WWE history. SummerSlam is right around the corner, and there have been some great, fantastic matches, and have been some great builds to the summer, uh, summer WrestleMania. That's pretty much what it is. It's WrestleMania in the summer. So we're gonna check out some of these uh, legendary builds to some of these great matches that happened at SummerSlam. Appreciate all love and support you guys are showing on channel. Didn't mean to go full screen like that. <laughs> and uh, let's get right into this one, man. If this list was released two weeks from now, I can tell you as a certainty that the top spot would be occupied by Roman Reigns versus Jey Uso. For sure. It's not very often that we see a SummerSlam story be on the receiving end of an all-time epic build, the kind usually reserved for WrestleMania. Yeah. A lot of the time in recent years, the SummerSlam card would be thrown together before the show without much thought, despite being WWE's second biggest show of the year. This, of course, is your notification that you won't be seeing matches like Dean Ambrose versus Dolph Ziggler during the next 11 minutes. However, when WWE has a clear goal in mind, they can give us a SummerSlam build that would indeed convince you that this is the WrestleMania of the summer. Here's mm -hmm. to more positive like I just lists. Said. I'm Tempest hailing from Parts Unknown. WrestleMania and these are the 10 of the summer, man. SummerSlam builds in WWE history. But before we get on with our list, make sure, of course, that you like this video. If you subscribe haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to, to Parts Unknown. Unknown. We are oh so close to our 250,000 subscriber goal. Man, that's awesome we're for going him, to man. be playing a four-player MyGM mode in WWE 2K23. You won't want to miss it, so get us to 250,000 today. Honorable mention, Mandy Rose versus Sonya Deville, 2020. Misses out on the list for really no other reason than being part of the bad times because somehow the comedy love triangle of Otis, Dolph Ziggler, and Mandy <laughs> Rose plus Sonya Deville meddling led to one of the best storylines of the year for WWE. I forgot that that was a thing. Like, people legitimately was buying into this OD, Otis, Mandy Rose thing. That's crazy. Culminating in a loser-leave WWE match at SummerSlam between the former Fire and Desire. It's just a shame that the year in question was the one no one will ever willingly go back and rewatch. Yeah. Number 10, Randy Orton versus Kofi Kingston, 2019. We begin with the butt-ass WWE Championship match from SummerSlam 2019 between mm -hmm. Kofi Kingston and Randy Orton. I mean, it's not their fault this match is a bullshit count-out finish only designed to stretch out this story for a yeah. rematch because the story behind this match deserved so much. The story was good. It was. It just wasn't executed per uh, executed well match wise, but the story was great. I was looking forward to this because of the real history they had in the past. I love this more, such as the story with much of Kofi's reign, really. Anyway, positivity. In 2009, Kofi Kingston looked poised to be a new top guy. He ruined Randy Orton's new car, was the sole survivor of a pretty good elimination match, and boom dropped Randy through a table at Madison yeah. Square Garden. Everything's looking up, right? Well, then Orton beat him at TLC, shouted stupid when Kofi forgot the finish of a Raw match, and bada bing bada boom, back to the mid card for another decade you go, Kofi. Yep. Fast forward to 2019, and Orton was consistently a roadblock in Kofi's way to get to WrestleMania, and then stood in his way again at SummerSlam, serving as the perfect final boss for Kofi Kingston's unique story. Is all that linear and told on purpose? No, but it aids the story and wrestling is about adapting. So as far as I'm concerned, this SummerSlam had a 10 year build and I won't hear otherwise. <laughs> Number nine, Team WWE versus The Nexus, 2010. Ooh. It may be becoming apparent that a stellar build does not a great match guarantee. However, let's take- Yeah, the build was great, but oh man, did they fail on execution, bro. <laughs> that negativity and put it right in the dumpster and instead focus on the imagination capturing run of the nexus from june of 2010 until that infamous match at SummerSlam. yeah so few times have there ever been such an instance of wwe getting an instant influx of new stars all at once and unfortunately even rarer are the times that has worked out but you stay in that dumpster negativity the former rookies of season one of NXT arrived at the end of Raw, colon, viewer's choice, and wreaked havoc and continued to do so in the coming weeks and months, yep. taking out legends like Bret Hart, Ricky Steamboat, like the heinous bastards they are, and also Vince McMahon. Maybe they didn't need stopping. Everyone <laughs> was into this shit. And John Cena's shaky recruitment of his fellow WWE stars, friend and foe, kept tension up until the very final Raw, uh -huh. when the crowd was so amped up for the teams to fight that the camera was literally shaking. <laughs> not how WWE usually shakes their cameras, like a good shake. Number eight, Seth Rollins versus Edge, 2021. When Ed they, yeah, they definitely should have. Legitimately, they definitely should have had them gone over. I believe that was uh John was feeling like the 
W the team WWE should have went over, but nah, they next year should have went over, bro. You're trying to build these guys, and that kind of messed up their momentum. Edge returned to WWE in 2020. There were loads of names people fantasy booked him to face. The name at the top of virtually everyone's list, Seth Mother. Rollins. Great view. On one hand, Seth was perhaps WWE's best in-ring performer at the time. On the other, there was that time he tried to literally murder yeah. Edge. Yeah, I think they may have had some unfinished business. In 2014, the authority was booted from WWE by Sting and John Cena's team at Survivor Series, and that lasted all of one month because WWE is a stupid company. Yeah. God, it's like, it's in my veins. It's negativity. I can't find its way out. Maybe I'm the problem. As we found ourselves in 2021, Seth felt that Edge had cut in line for a shot at the Universal Championship, and at Money in the Bank cost Edge said shot. Now that they had a reason to be fighting, mm -hmm. Edge started to really get to Seth, calling him Edge Light, and demanding he take the next step and be more than he was. I love storylines about wrestlers mm -hmm. being similar, and letting any anger or anxiety about those great similarities view. drive the story. And thankfully, this build actually gave us a great match. Facts. Number 7, <laughs> SummerSlam 2005. On paper, SummerSlam 2005, I think is the best SummerSlam ever. That card is stacked, loaded with excellently built matches and also Angle versus Eugene. <laughs> Would you get out of here? SummerSlam 05 has the quadruple feature of the excellently soap opera Mysterio family custody battle, mm -hmm. the blisteringly blurred lines of Matt Hardy and Edge's love triangle yeah. with Lita, the increasingly I forgot ridiculous- I forgot that was on that show too, yeah. I believe they had to they had to call off the match because uh, Matt was bleeding like crazy and they continued to feud. Ah, oh, this was a good summer. The ridiculous ridiculousness of The Undertaker's year-long rivalry with Randy Orton and quite possibly the most entertaining promo work of Shawn Michaels' second WWE run, building up his climactic match with Hulk Hogan. Yep. HBK's heel run in the summer of 05 was a thing of beauty. The heel turn on Hogan, the Larry King parody, yep. and... Of course, who's your daddy, Montreal? Yeah. It is a loaded show, and I haven't even mentioned the world title matches. Best ever on paper. If only there weren't little things wrong with the big matches. <laughs> hey! Number six, <laughs> Edge versus The Undertaker, 2008. Okay, 2008, surely I can't be negative about that. The Undertaker's feud with Edge was over a year long, beginning when Edge was a sneaky little sausage uh -huh. and cashed in Money in the Bank on Zombie Joe in May 2007 before tormenting him until WrestleMania and beyond. By the summer of 2008, Edge and Vicky Guerrero had forcibly removed the dead man from the company, but then Edge cheated on his woman yep, and she made him that. fight an immortal wizard in a box. That's why you stay faithful, lads. The SummerSlam 08 pay-per-view cycle was loaded with fantastic character work from Edge, who one could classify as deranged, singling out Mick Foley to tell him what he needed to do to- Oh yeah, I remember this, Mick was like, I, I, I need that Edge that speared me through a flaming table at WrestleMania, not this Edge. Oh, that was such a good build, and then it's like he transformed. I believe he went rogue on Mick, because Mick, Mick wanted it. He got what he asked for. And then he just, you know, it, he he started going rogue on Vicky. Like, you put me in this match. You want me to be this way. I'm going to show you what's up when they uh, had the Hell in a Cell match, man. <laughs> uh, Edge and uh, Undertaker. I remember this. This was, this was good. <laughs> Succeed inside Hell in a Cell, given Foley's history with the Stip, with Undertaker, and with Edge. Foley told Edge that he needed to look within himself and find the Edge that had speared him through a flaming yep. table and made him say that he was the best wrestler in the world, otherwise Undertaker would tear him apart. Edge accepted this constructive criticism and killed Mick Foley, sending him to the hell that was TNA. I mean, that <laughs> is sadistic. It's not negativity if it's aimed at TNA. The whole build was incredibly psychological with Edge at the forefront, one of the best storytellers of his time. Number five, uh, CM Punk versus Jeff Hardy, 2009. Ooh, this was good. Nowhere in the contract does this it say, so under good. any circumstances, do not cash in on Jeff Hardy. Yeah. That has always been one of my favorite quotes of this excellent rivalry. Mm -hmm. It perfectly encapsulates why the first WWE. And it worked. Because, once again, Punk was a babyface. But he had a point. Nowhere did it say, I can't cash in on him. It ain't nowhere in the contract to say, I can't cash in on Jeff. No, and people hated him for it. It didn't work, bro. It's logical. 
I would do the same thing, babyface or not. <laughs> heel turn of CM Punk was so effective. It's a much slower heel turn than people remember, uh -huh. taking almost a full month before his turn is solidified after cashing in on Jeff Hardy at Extreme Rules. Punk was prepared to keep his morals because, in reality, he didn't do anything Dude. wrong. He, did. he just happened to step on someone more beloved than he was. Thus, the constant vitriol from the fans eventually had Punk lean in and say, all right, f you, I don't want to be a hero to you anyway. But even mm -hmm. still, while definitely much more of a cock than he was previously, he still wasn't telling lies. That That's his thing now, right? Punk was living a clean <laughs> lifestyle while Jeff Hardy was a quote end quote free spirit. And yeah, one of those is safer and healthier for sure. But like, stop being a dick about it. The best kind of heel work. A dick, but right. The rivalry of the year for 2009 culminated for sure. in the main event of SummerSlam in a fantastic TLC match, and by the time we reached it, Punk was a shadow of his former, more respective self. Now an angry, self-righteous, vengeful version of himself, having completed one of the best character arcs of any wrestler of the time. Mm -hmm. Number four, Bret Hart versus Owen Hart, 1994. Boy, does WWE love them a brother versus brother story. Oh, of course. Matt versus Jeff. Taker versus Kane, Edge versus Christian, but take it back to the start and you will find Brett and his brother Owen. Holders of the crown of best opening match in WrestleMania history, matters had been escalating since Survivor Series through the Royal Rumble and they weren't yet settled with Owen's win at WrestleMania 10. Brett winning the WWE Championship later in the show didn't make Owen feel like the most important heart of the night, mm -hmm. and he just wouldn't stand for that. Winning King of the Ring and being his entertaining Owen Hart self until he and Brett met once again, this time in a steel cage match at SummerSlam 1994. There weren't very many long-term stories culminating at SummerSlam back in those days, and I suppose one could have put The Undertaker versus quote-unquote The Undertaker on this <laughs> list, but one would have to have different tastes in wrestling than I. Could have said something negative there, but I'm working on it. That's good. Number three, Triple H Keep versus the, the Rock versus Kurt Angle, 2000. <laughs> now, granted, The Rock, the WWF champion, the biggest star in the industry at the time, was absolutely the third wheel in his own SummerSlam main event. Um, that porch. being said, the remaining two wheels made up one of the best storylines in WWE history. Well, maybe like three quarters of a great story. We're almost there. <laughs> Which means I get to be three quarters positive for this one. The Triple H, Kurt Angle, Stephanie McMahon love triangle could be looked at as the peak of WWE's soap opera and spandex style of storytelling, with everyone playing their roles to perfection and a wrestling belt drifting in and out of focus. Is the actual pay-per-view cycle prior to SummerSlam 2000 actually messy as hell? Absolutely. Did they botch the end of the storyline beyond belief because of Triple H's ego? Unquestionably. <laughs> but this storyline playing out over the course of the summer was the best story of WWE's most consistently great year. And if I had a TV and a credit card in 2000, you can bet my three and a half year old ass would have bought this pay-per-view because of it. <laughs> Number two, The Fiend versus Finn Balor, 2019. This was really, this was actually pretty good. The build towards this was perfect. I remember it was one of my most viewed videos on my channel. I think I had to take it down. I'm not sure. I think I had to take it down. I'm not sure. But it was one of my most viewed videos on, on my personal page, bro. The build towards this was fantastic. We didn't know what we were going to get until we finally got it. Because we always had those little Mr. Roger vignettes. But when we finally seen the fiend in action, his music... All of it, this was perfect. Crowd was chanting, holy, you know what? Before he even, like, did anything, this was, and he murdered. He legitimately murdered Finn Balor. <laughs> and now for something completely different. I maintain that the only reason people wet themselves over the thought of The Fiend was this period of time. Right. And also the Firefly Funhouse match. Yes, that too. But really, it is this buildup and this payoff. Yeah. It had been some time since we had seen healed Bray Wyatt teaming with Matt Hardy in 2018. And when we got to the spring of 2019, most of WWE was pretty terrible. And amidst the mess was a brand new Bray Wyatt character. A much more different version of the character than we had seen before. I thought Matt was supposed to be the broken one. Every week, the Mr. Rogers yeah. Bray would let audiences in little by little, and then boom, scary clown demon. Hands yep. up if you expected that. Yeah. We were then shown flashes of the fiend. Not uh -huh. enough for us to get a eye ache looking at him with an incessant red light, just glimpses. So when it came time for the fiend to actually do the wrestle, everyone was incredibly intrigued by what we were going to see. It genuinely is mind blowing to think that this build full of subtlety, nuance, and patience was taking place the same time as shit like this, yeah. or this, or this, or this, or this, whoa. 
Okay, too, too much negativity even. <laughs> Let's go out on the highest of notes. Only positivity from here on out. And number one, Triple H. I'm glad he put it up there. I wasn't going to say anything. I just wanted to see if this was going to be on the list. And I'm glad it's on the list. I'm glad it's at number one. It deserves to be number one on the SummerSlam build list. This is one of the best feuds WWE has ever produced. And one of the best, uh, best storylines leading up to this match. Even afterwards, this feud was so fantastic, bro. Triple H, Shawn Michaels, O2. Fucking fantastic. Versus bro. Shawn Michaels, 2002. So good. Is this storyline wacky? Of course, and I do not at all feel inclined to take points away from a pro wrestling grudge match for being wacky. Some people have ring rust after being away for a couple of months with an injury, and then there's Shawn Michaels, who can step back into a WWE ring for the first time in four and a half years and be the best in the business. Yep. One of a kind. The anticipation of HBK's first match back was palpable, brought on by the incredible work done by Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and everyone else involved to make Shawn seem as believably close to permanent injury as possible, while in reality, yeah, he was all right. Yeah. And all of that isn't even considering the mountain of history shared between Trips and HB Shizzle. The countless layers of real and kayfabe love and heat between them, making for maybe the most hotly anticipated SummerSlam match of all time. So and again, good, I must bro. reiterate that this was Shawn Michaels coming out of retirement. Mm -hmm. And it was good, unlike that other time. <laughs> and that's our list. Make sure, of course, nah. that you like this video, subscribe if you haven't. <laughs> that, that shit was fantastic, bro. That is one of the best blood feuds in WWE history. It's a feud that I can frequently go back and watch. They had great matches. You, They made you believe that they hated each other, bro. Like they wanted to murder each other. And it was fantastic. I love it. I love it. I'm glad it was on the list. Comment down below. Let me know what's your favorite SummerSlam build. Uh will build to a match at SummerSlam of all time. Uh, for me, obviously, it's Triple H uh, versus HBK. That was that was one of my favorite ones, and you know the matches afterward afterwards was fantastic. But if it wasn't on this list, what's your favorite SummerSlam uh, build of all time? But I appreciate all the love and support you guys showing on the channel. Road to 150k, and I'm still young to be the YouTube wrestling champ of the world. Appreciate y'all kicking me. See y'all next one. Peace.